Where do you start? I rented a typewriter, sat down and started once upon a time. Was it a success? It's reviewed by the New Yorker. Tell me about the aftermath of the book. I think about it a lot. How do you go about staying creative? You need a certain amount of independence and quite a lot of ego. Don't ever say anything you've heard before. What about if people want to make a living? How do, how do people go and get published? First of all... Welcome to The Mood Podcast, where each week we bring you inspiring conversations with top artists and creative minds from various fields, exploring their personalities, their purposes, processes, and philosophies. Whether you're a seasoned photographer, an aspiring artist, or simply someone who loves to learn and be inspired, this podcast is for you. I'm your host, Matt Jacob, and thank you so much for joining me in today's conversation. Our guest today is Diana Darling, an acclaimed writer and artist from America, but who has been living in Bali for the last 40 or so years. Her novel, The Painted Alphabet, released in the 90s, is a beautiful blend of Balinese mythology and contemporary narrative, offering readers a vivid exploration of spirituality, morality, and the timeless battle between good and evil. We talk about the inspiration behind her novel and the process of translating her observations and experiences of Bali into a literary masterpiece. She explains the timeless impact of the story's themes, including spirituality, moral dilemmas, and the battle between good and evil, and how she was able to express such moralities that are more relevant than ever today. Diana also shares her unique perspective on spirituality and death, influenced by her Western heritage and her extensive life in Asia. She reflects on the profound changes she has witnessed on this beautiful island over the decades she has been here, and how these transformations have impacted her philosophies, creativity, and art. We explore her academic background, including her time at the School of Fine Arts in Paris and the New York School of Social Research in New York, and discuss how these experiences have shaped her literary work and storytelling approach. Throughout our conversation, Diana provides really valuable insights into her writing techniques, her pre-writing and drafting processes, and how she approaches revisions. We also discuss the importance of community and collaboration with Diana sharing how her work with local and international artists and writers has influenced her creative process. Additionally, she offers practical advice for staying curious and creative balancing discipline and spontaneity, and fostering an environment that nurtures creativity. Her expertise in editing and branding is also covered, providing artists with key principles for effectively communicating their unique style and vision through their marketing texts. This episode is packed with rich wisdom, practical advice, and inspiring stories from Diana Darling's remarkable journey. I hope you enjoy Diana Darling, welcome to the Move Podcast. Thank you very much. As a, I mean, I don't want to put you in any boxes, but as a literary artist, multiculturalist, even historian, maybe looking at some of your previous work, certainly in local life here in Bali, I'm interested in, certainly to begin with, spirituality, life and death and your kind of your views on that, having lived in Asia, but also having essentially the genetics of a Westerner, but your environmental influences for the, for the past so many decades being in Asia. So what is your view on death and how do you think, and how has that kind of impacted your craft and your, your writing over so many years? Well, uh, thank you for asking that. It's an interesting question. Um, my thoughts about death are really formed by living here. And I've absorbed as much as I can the Balinese attitude to death, which is it's not an emergency. It happens. It's natural. It's a process. And it's nothing to show off about except at the cremation. But it's, a, it's not a personal tragedy when it happens to you. It's, it's a call to go to work for the people who are around you. It's uh, death in Bali 
like everything else, is not sentimental. And this is the biggest lesson, I think, uh, from the Balinese that I've learned. This, the sentimentality around natural processes is just, um, it's a construction from my own Western culture. It's, it's not a fact of life. So that, I don't know what happens when people die. Uh, I know that we probably won't see them again. I know that the Balinese believe that a great deal happens after you die that takes a lot of ritual attention. And so you have a lot of protocol around the care of the body, but also a lot of offerings and rituals around the care of the soul, which is going through a transition. First, it has to get out of the body, which uh, according not just to the Balinese, but I think the Tibetan Buddhists as well, and certainly many other cultures, takes a bit of time. I'm just struck by when I watched my mother die in hospice. It was a thoroughly natural and good process, and I was lucky to watch it. But I had the sensation, without being at all psychic myself, I had the sensation of watching this fine scarf rise up from off her forehead. And that's my only indication that anything is going on, that there's a... a but I knew that was the moment that she died. And I said, fly, mom, <laughs> at that time. Now, the Balinese seem to have a lot of very detailed information about what exactly happens. Uh, so the, the the soul is leaving the body over what the Buddhists say is about 20 minutes. And the Balinese want to, they want to uh, assure a transition back to the essential elements of uh, water, air, fire, earth, and ether, whatever that is. So this all takes a lot of ritual supervision or help. Um, and then there's the journey of the, the surviving soul, the Atman, uh, onto a series of processes of purification, um, a kind of purgatory apparently, under the sea, and then calling the soul back up from the sea, this is after cremation, calling it back again and escorting it up to uh, the temples in Basaki, where it joins with the rest of the ancestors that may or may not incarnate into your family. And then some of it comes back into the family compound and is buried under a shrine, and that's where you worship your ancestors or your recently dead. So now, how much of that uh, I can take on? I don't know. I, I won't know until uh, I die or perhaps until my husband dies and I go through this process more intimately. Um, but I know that it's, as I say, it's not a sentimental event when somebody dies. It's, being sad is not the same as being sentimental. You're sad, everybody's sad, and then you get on with things. It's something that, that we live with, and perhaps it's better to live with being aware of it. Uh, I'm not sure. I think so. I think as I get older, uh, I'm much more aware of it. I don't think it's impacted my writing at all, though. Okay. Interesting that you... It seemed to take a observational standpoint, kind of a, a distance from that belief system or cultural practice. Is that something that you've, I guess, deliberately taken a position on, or is it something that you kind of experimented with or dived in? I know you've obviously have experienced this culture for, for many a time. You've written a book on it, which we're going to get to. You've had a husband who's obviously from here and et cetera, et cetera. So you're kind of integrated as much as you can be as a Westerner, but it seems like there's still a, a distance between you and their, the religion here, or at least the cultural practices. Would that be fair to say? Oh, absolutely. Yes. There's a difference because I'm not Balinese, 
although there was a time in my life when I would have loved to be Balinese, but it's not possible to become Balinese. I, th I think even Javanese would have trouble becoming Balinese. It's a, unless you're born into the culture and have the very earliest rights and the and an upbringing within a Balinese family, it's it's not possible. And I came here fully formed. I was in my early thirties when I first came here. So and I was very formed as well because I was uh, an artist. I had struggled to build up a a faculty of discrimination of things. Uh, I had very uh, strong values about art and creativity and uh, what was expected of me in life. And it was, you know, it's like a finished Western person. And then, of course, I loved all of that being challenged, being in Bali, and I was fascinated by the challenge. But um, the distance is a natural one. I can empathize with it. I can make things up inside it, but um, I'm very much uh, who I am, in, you know, a, a product of the West. I ask because I'm fascinated with the, the, the dichotomy and the balance between nature and nurture, and also religion and its geographies, because one then might not be able to move to a certain place fully integrate them, spend more of their life in one place than not in that place, try to understand and immerse themselves in either a cultural religion or the blurred lines in between and not necessarily feel like they can become that. So when you think about Balinese Hinduism, the, the kind of external um, the immersification of people into that religion is almost non-existent. So therefore you could only be that religion if you're born here. Does that make any sense? Um, I think I know what you mean. At the same time, I have to say that uh, in the beginning, when I was first here, say the first 20 years that I was here, I took part in the religion and it I was really immersed in it. I did everything I could to understand it and to take part in it because it's a very experiential religion. You know, it's very much about doing things ritualistic and yes yeah. yes it's it's a ritual it's it's a it's a behavior in uh it's the right behavior in the right environment whether it's in a temple or in the rice fields or at home or whatever it is that kind of huge uh context was very easy to absorb in in the er my in my early days here in the 1980s when you're living really very, very close to the ground and in the midst of the weather, in the midst of nature and everything else is, you know, it's easy. This, uh, this idea of the invisible world, it was almost tangible in those days. Now it's hard. Now it's hard to get a sense of, uh, oh, this is a populated space. Mostly we, we feel, uh, the presence of other people and the presence of ideas and and constructions, buildings. The invisible world, um, to me, has sort of retracted a bit, perhaps, or uh, I mean, for me anyway. Why? I mean, is that a a byproduct of more distractions and more um, differences, more cultural differences? coming into the space? I, I think that's certainly part of it. I think just the fact of construction uh, is a big factor. When you pave over the family courtyard, the ground behaves differently. Um, it's the same place, but the nature of the place has changed. Not that I'm at all a mystic, but I think that what goes through the earth and comes up through the ground, you know, it, it runs faster when it's not covered with cement or tiles or, or whatever it is. When you take down big trees, um, whatever has been in, inhabiting that tree moves. It can be bugs, it can be birds, it can be ghosts. 
uh, and so the place changes. And I think uh, if you ask a very young Balinese person what they feel around uh, a holy place or something else, I have no idea how they would answer. I just no idea. I know for people my age, you know, uh, they say, oh, it's a pity they've renovated this temple. You know, it was fine before, they'd say. That wouldn't be allowed in other religions, would it? I mean, if you took, if you, if you demolished a mosque, let's say, and built over that, that there would be world war. Is that true to say? I mean, why, why are Balinese so, um, not forgiving, but welcoming and very um, calm about those types of things and very almost um, equanimous with that type of behavior or those types of externalities impacting their, their culture? I think it might be because they're very confident about what the cosmos is, very self-confident in who they are, and what their place is in it. And uh, it's not easily jostled by uh, ugly buildings or too many people. I mean, some people are getting more uh, irritable when, uh, when they see their, their land changing or uh, they're very touchy about uh, desecration too, but not as much as Indonesian Muslims. You know, there's a great deal of tolerance. I think they're profoundly stable at a certain point in the, in themselves. Extremely. And that's uh, going back to the, something you mentioned earlier about your earlier self coming to Bali and you had very strong values. Much of it probably, a complete assumption, but I know what I was like when I was 30, much of it probably linked to an ego and, you know, very much, I'm going to assert myself on this world, right, in space. I sense that from the Balinese here, and that's one of the attractions of living here, is that maybe that tolerance comes from a lack of materialism and maybe a lesser identity with self. And so that's something to be inspired by. Well, those are two very different things. I wouldn't say the Balinese are not materialistic. They certainly are. But um, having a sense of, I think their sense of self is a lot more diffuse than ours is. Ours is restricted to the ego, um, possibly a bit left over for family, country, tribe, whatever that is. But the Balinese superego, in a certain sense, is in the village, in the way of doing things. Um, it's not, it's not a particularly jingoistic in the sense that there's Balinese nationalism. There's been a, a trace of that since the the terrorist attacks in the early part of the century. But uh, the identity is, is spread out through the family, through their ancestors. Ancestors are extremely important here. Yeah. Um, the larger family, the village, the Banjar uh, community, um, a way of doing things. There's a, there's a sense of Balinese identity in that they distinguish themselves from other Indonesians. They, they're aware of the, of the fact that there's a Balinese way of doing things that's different. And they think it's excellent, um, which again is, gives them this confidence. It's almost a separate nationality, isn't it? Yeah, it's a, it's a separate ethnos. Yeah, that's a better word for it. If you can put it that way, yeah. Tell me about your early days as an artist. I know you went to school at the, the I'm, like, I'm not going to pronounce the French, in Paris at the School of Fine Arts, oh, let's right. say. What did you study there that. and how did you get into art and what did you bring to Bali in those early days as an artist? Well, I was uh, a sculptor when I came here and um, that began, I was in the theater before when I lived in New York. I wanted to be an actress and I went to Europe on a short holiday maybe two months. And uh, I was in London for a long time because I wanted to go to the theater. I thought theater in London is going to be better than theater in New York. And then in my last week, I went to Paris. It was springtime. 
it was a totally magical time for me. Uh, and I happened to see a piece of sculpture in someone's studio. <clears throat> the artist wasn't there. It was a, uh, this is a, the work of Ipustigi, which was in marble. It, it was a, a, a kind of a lying figure called the death of the mother. And it was, it struck me like a piece of Beethoven's music. It's really what it evoked, the, this, the figurative expressionism, I suppose you'd call it, but it was, the impact was enormous. And I said, that's what I want to do. So I went back to New York, said goodbye to my mother and moved to Europe. And I uh, went to Carrara to learn to carve the marble. And after three years there, I went up to, I learned to carve the marble. After three years there, I went to Paris to draw because that was the example of uh, this Ipustigi that there were a, a handful of young sculptors that he sort of mentored. And that was the example he gave to us in his own practice. You go somewhere, you draw for a year or two. Right. So I was at the Beaux-Arts, which is the art school in Paris, and I went to, um, I was in a, a master class for sculpture where we just modeled in clay from a live model, and I went to drawing classes. And this was just all to develop what you need to know if, if you're a sculptor, especially uh, anything figurative at all. My work was um, also a kind of figurative expressionism. I made imaginary anatomies, and uh, some of them were, in the beginning, they were a bit monstrous, but very, very finely carved, I can say. And uh, I was trying to, whatever I wanted to do in theater, I was trying to do it in marble. And enjoying the fact that my work was between my hands and that if anyone wanted to know who I was, they didn't have to look at me. They looked at what I made. So that's where my head was when I, when I came to Bali. Uh, I was coming from Europe, from a very mature art scene there, uh, to a place that had no art scene. The art in Bali in those days was religious. Mm. Dances. Dances. Uh, the statues were either sitting in a little temple or guarding a gateway or a pathway. And I tried making some sculpture like that too, just sort of for fun. But um, it was the, the religion here, which was everything that was interesting to me, not, certainly not the sculpture. You know, and there was, as I say, there was no art scene at all, like anything I was accustomed to. So I just put it behind right, me. Right, okay. And, uh, and I read and read and read everything I could about Bali and eventually began to write about it. And had you had any training in writing or you just kind of learned by no, yourself? No, I had good teachers. Okay. <laughs> and uh, I'd read a lot. And I was, I've always been a good reader. And so how, I, I noticed actually on page one of the Painted Alphabet, you said, for, for my teachers, right? So where, where were you taught? Were you taught here? And what kind of teaching did you have for writing? Well, I've had teachers, wonderful teachers all through my life. I had wonderful teachers in school. Um, I had teacher figures in my life. Um, I suppose I was also thinking of the old priest in our village who was uh, something of a teacher. He was actually a drinking mate. <laughs> um, and then there was our landlord, who is the son of the famous Balinese painter, Igustinio Man Lempard. Who, uh, Lempard had already died of old age by the time I came to Bali. And his son was already an old man too. And he was a great friend to my first husband who was Australian, John Darling. And uh, John just soaked up anything this man said. And so did I, because, uh, so he had someone to talk to, to, to puff up his ideas, to 
to think out loud with. So it, it was very much a learning experience, all of this. And I thought, I could live here forever because I couldn't possibly learn everything about it. You know, if one day I get bored, I'll, I'll take up uh, the Balinese language, which is impossible to learn. <laughs> and I feel like that as well. I mean, we've only been here a couple of years, but uh, I feel like there's an endless amount to learn, endless amount to kind of dive into and just get, get your head around. It seems to be layer upon layer upon layer. Language is a huge part, obviously, with so many languages in Indonesia generally and dialects here in Bali. So, um, yeah, I feel feel that definitely. Tell me about the lead up to arguably your seminal moment in terms of the painted alphabet and your your first novel. Tell me about the process in writing that before we start talking about the book. What was the process like? What kind of was it a conscious decision? Right. I'm going to write a novel or were you did you find yourself in an environment where oh, I, I feel like I can write something here? Well, the first uh, my encounter with this story came when I was reading about Ranga, mm -hmm. basically, and the story that was always performed in the temples uh, in in my time was Chalonarang. Mm -hmm. But there was another story. Uh, there were several other stories that used to be performed that lead up to the this confrontation between Ranga and the Barong. This so-called confrontation of good and evil, which it isn't. Um, and I was reading about those other stories when I came across uh, a synopsis of the story of Duku Siladri. And there were two things in it that really piqued my fancy. Uh, one was the talking animals, and the other was a scene where uh, this junior witch goes down to the river and uh, takes a bath, and she finishes and puts her clothes back on, and then she hears a man coming. So she takes all her clothes off again. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought that was great. And I, and I thought, I said to my husband, shouldn't we, uh, shouldn't we try to sponsor a performance of this? Because it used to be performed as an aja, which is the Balinese opera form where they sing the poetry, right? And uh, so we, we organized a performance for a temple festival near us in our village. And it wasn't at all what I hoped it would be as, as a theatrical experience. I thought there'd be rehearsals and they'd make costumes for the animals and all this. I had no idea. Uh, it was just another Arja performance. And be, an hour before they started, the Arja master came out and told the troop, okay, now this is the story tonight, and this is what happens, and you play this, and you play oh. this. It was so formulaic. Wow. So I thought, oh my gosh, I'll just write it uh, for my own pleasure, and, you know, to see what I can get out of, this, out of this synopsis, to see what I can get out of the story. So over the next few years, um, my husband John and I uh, would ask old people when we met them if they knew the Duku Saladri story, and they'd all laugh, and they'd sing a little bit of it, and then they would tell the story. So I began collecting these versions of the story. And then when our marriage broke up, uh, I happened to be in Australia, in Sydney, waiting for him to take his stuff off my stuff in storage. And I had two weeks to wait, two weeks to fill in, and I was very anxious to, to be at work. I was going to go on to the foundry in Melbourne to make some sculpture, but I really wanted to make something in, during those two weeks. So I decided this is a good time to start that novel. Um, and so I rented a typewriter. It was, that's how long ago it was. <laughs> and uh, I sat down and started once upon a time and started writing it out like that. I already had uh, the story blocked out in, in my head and in notes. And then later on, when I was well into the story, uh, I came across uh, a, a printed version of the original poem that the, the story is based on. Somebody had written out in Balinese verse, 94 pages, 
uh, on a long term? Yes. Well, no, the 94 typewritten pages wow. um, of Balinese verse. And somebody got a copy for me from a university. Oh, so you just copied it. Great. So I, so I brought it back to Bali, showed it to my next husband, who I have still. And uh, he slowly read it out to me and we talked about it. And so I was able to adjust the, the, the story a bit to go on, you know, to take in elements that hadn't been in the, in the oral versions that I'd collected. And then I just wrote it out. It's a wonderful story, essentially at the top of it, between good and evil. But there's so many kind of um, spiritual journeys along the way, sacrifices with... Um, you know, that I'm not going to give any of the story away because everyone should read it. But w w if A, was it a success? B, what was the, the success for you internally when you're writing this novel? And what you know, kind of what did you get from it when you've achieved this book? Was it a sense of, you know, wonder with the world and what could be next? Or was it a sense of achievement? Tell, tell me about the aftermath of basically the book and, and how it did with both you know, in the market, but also with, with yourself and how you kind of moved through life after that? Well, it was tremendous fun to write. It was, it really was my own entertainment. And um, when I finished it, I thought, I read it again, and I thought, this is pretty good, actually. And I was going to America to visit my family in the around 1990, I guess. And I took my portfolio of sculpture and the manuscript of this novel, and I said, I'll see which one goes. And I showed my portfolio around to some galleries in New York, and they said, well, this is very nice, but you have to live here. I said, but I live in Bali. Oh, well, I'm not sure what, what, what we can do. Uh, but... It was different with publishing. I had a, I was staying with a cousin who had a friend who was an agent who uh, read it. And she said, I'd love to represent this. Uh, and so she did, and she found a publisher, a good publisher for me, uh, Houghton Mifflin, which is one of the big old American publishers. And um, it was a very happy uh, deal. They took it on. They gave me a little bit of an advance. And when it came out, they this is the advantage of having a really good publisher. They managed uh, to have an art, a review, I guess it was, uh, with a little interview in the middle of it in the New York Times. Wow. Big three quarters of a page in the New York Times is reviewed by the New Yorker. So it had, and they were, you know, very friendly uh, reviewers as well. You had great reviews for the book. Yes. So that was, that was wonderful. You know, it was more than I ever hoped for. But I thought, oh, this is great. Because I was, I was writing it for people who I respected, people who I looked up to, but who knew nothing about Bali. Mm. And so I had uh, some hope that it would be, not just a few people in Ubud that would read it, but you know that it was for that it was a reading book. You know that would be for anyone who likes to read. Yeah, definitely a popular approach to a book and making it more accessible, I guess, to people who aren't necessarily as esoteric or specific to that place that you're writing about and those people you're writing about. Is that a challenge with writing? Where I mean, you're obviously a very intelligent woman, and there's you know, so much vocabulary as well as I think three or four or five different languages that you speak. Is is there a challenge to not make your writing too academic or too esoteric and still make it accessible to the likes of me who just can read the most basic of verse? Is that is that something you think about when writing? Uh, I think about it uh, a lot. I think when I reread the painted alphabet, there are places where it feels just a bit rich. Okay. Um, and I think as I get older, as a writer, I get simpler, uh, and I hope I become more clear. And the challenge to me 
even when I'm writing something very mundane and uh, like about somebody's hotel or something like that, I try to make it, um, I try very hard to avoid marketing language. I try to make it fresh yeah. so that if anybody bothers to read it, uh, which isn't likely usually, people don't read anything anymore. But if somebody bothers to read what I write, they'll say, oh, and uh, and then they'll go in further. That It's inviting a conversation, really. Why do you think we don't read much anymore? I think people don't read books very much anymore because they're dirty and smelly <laughs> and time-consuming. Um, it breaks my heart, but the, the children in our family don't read. They don't have any books. They just don't read. When they want to, re when the teenager wants to read something, he borrows something from us. But uh, the parents don't read to them. Um, it's a it's a different culture now. It's an electronic culture. TV is stronger. If the news, you can read about it. I subscribe to the New York Times still. But if I've seen the news, uh, I don't read the story. Do you read the opinion columns though? Or the commentary? Sorry? Do you read the opinion columns or the co commentary? You know, non-factual news, more like thoughts and opinions. In, in Often. Those type, yeah. Often. Yeah. Yeah. But um, but I still I'm I'm still a reader. Yeah. But I think that um, it's a generational thing, mainly. Yeah, I think digitized world has to has a lot to answer for for that. Um, you know whether and we were talking about audio books before we came came on on air weren't we and i'm more of a i mean i read read books but 90 percent of reading is i i listen to so i mm. listen to something all the time we talked about kind of the power of that and maybe i'd love for you to narrate your the painted alphabet because i think having authors speak those words gives you more of an insight as to the intent and tone to what they were meaning and you know avoids any misinterpretation but yeah i i think there is a romance to reading books. There is a nostalgia to it. And um, whether it, I mean, it arguably benefits society, the more people are educated or read or have reading abilities, right? Um, because it sparks curiosity. It sparks um, the desire to, to see someone else's opinion. It sparks conversation. There's so many benefits to it, isn't it? But um, I don't know. I don't know where, where it goes from here. We'll have... AI reading to us before, before too long. <laughs> <laughs> or not. Or not. Yeah. Um, tell us about the writing process. You know, I want to kind of appeal to, um, to, to, to want to be writers out there and me being one of them. I, I really enjoy the writing process. I do some newsletters every week and just general copy stuff for whether it's my photography stuff or this podcast. I really enjoy it. I don't, I, it's very, intangible i can't I can't really put my finger on where that satisfaction comes from but i'd love to know what your process is when you you know maybe you get a new job or you you think of something you want to write for yourself how do you go about doing that where you know where do you start blank canvas what's the process for me it begins with hearing the first sentence in my head and i'll wait around for that uh walk around do something um, sit around, look at out the window, whatever. When I have the first sentence, that's my keyhole. So you have a concept already or have been given a concept and then you are essentially waiting for yourself to come up with that first sentence. Yeah. Okay, interesting. Yeah. And then that's it, you're off. Well, sometimes. And if it, if that's not enough, if I'm still like digging around, I'll write with a pencil with a mechanical pencil on a big uh, folio-sized piece of paper, a kind of clipboard. Okay. I write in pencil, and then once I have a, a bit of a body to it, then I transcribe it to the computer, editing as I go, and then then I'll keep going. I, I tend to sort of, like a painter I knew once, he started in the upper left-hand corner of a canvas, and he painted a cross and was, until he got down to the bottom, then he signed it and he was finished. So I, I write a bit like that, you know, like I start at the beginning and and go through building. As and edit as, edit as you go as well. 
I do a lot of editing, yeah. Yeah. For other people as well? For other for, people as yeah. well. That's part of my freelance work. Okay. And tell us about that a little bit. I mean, how do you edit without putting your own spin on it? Or, you know, I've, I've never done editing, obviously, and I'm, I'm interested to hear about, more about what that actually involves and, and what the process of that is. Well, uh, most of my experience editing has been with uh, the Lone Tar Foundation, which is a publisher in Jakarta of English translations of Indonesian literature. So when I get a text to edit, it's the translation, but I also get the Indonesian original with it. And I'll begin going through the text. And if I run into something where uh, it's not clear uh, what's meant, I refer to the original and I might retranslate it uh, to make it clearer. That's um, an advantage that you had asked about multilingualism mm. in, in my work. That's a help when you can read the original. Not all editors of translations have the second, the other languages. Um, and they edit purely on the English, but sometimes it helps. There's, there's a, a bit of a, a collaboration going on there. Uh, I communicate with the translator, and everything I do is uh, I use track changes, if you know what I mean by that. No. It's, a, it's a thing in Microsoft Word where every change you make in a manuscript, it shows up. Got it, yeah. See, nice. And you can also make comments and mm -hmm. things like that. So that's a kind of conversation I'm having with the, the translator. But the idea, uh, I think that what my job is as, a, as an editor of a translated text is to make the English as strong and clear as possible. And that's not necessarily the job of the translator. Sometimes uh, they're more concerned with reproducing an identical meaning or uh, as close to identical uh, a meaning as there is, but it doesn't always make for good sentences. Mm. So I work on that skin on the surface that's going to touch the eyes of the reader. Uh, and and I'm very lucky that the Lone Tar Foundation has such a a good head uh, in John McGlynn. He's the American who founded it, and he's he's a translator himself. But um, somehow he realizes that his own English isn't the very best on earth either, and he uh, turns it over to an editor to deal with that too to make um, a correct translation into literary English, because these are mostly works of fiction. They're literary works, and so they, they need just that last bit of work. So from the technical side of editing and writing, how do you go about staying creative? And or how, do, how would you advise people like me and other artists who, who want to spur creativity in their life and curiosity? And how do you kind of go through life, I guess, maintaining a level of curiosity and inspiration? Do you pick from sources or do you, is it endemic to kind of you and your, your environment? I think, um, I think what it takes, Virginia Woolf had thoughts about this. Uh, she said for a woman to write, uh, she needs money and a room of her own. But I think this is true of uh, men as well. You need a certain amount of independence and uh, quite a lot of ego. And since we moved to Ubud and are living in the family compound, there's not really room for ego when you're living closely with a lot of people. And um, I haven't been writing fiction really since then. So I try to find... I try to find a kind of, not creativity, but um, a feeling of having done good work by being as professional as possible. And you can bring a certain amount of creativity to copywriting um, or editing. It's, it depends on how hard you push. I think that's what it is. I think you, if, when you uh, want to do 
your very, very best. That's similar to being creative. Is that what you mean by needing an ego? Where, where does the ego fit into that? It doesn't so much. Okay. It doesn't so much. Create, when I say creativity, I'm thinking of fiction. Okay. And that takes a lot of ego. Imagination almost. Yeah, it's, it's time when people can't bother you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and uh, open-ended time, which doesn't exist in family life if you're, even when you you have people to help you, it, it's a hard thing to, to sh you, you can't do it. I can't do it. I can't shut people out. I can't say, don't bother feed me for four hours. It just doesn't, doesn't happen like that. What is your advice then to um, people like, well, anyone, let's say, I know you do some work for brands and companies, maybe website copy or marketing copywriting, something like that. Is there any kind of tips or advice that let's say me as a photographer can kind of take on board when we're writing things about ourselves, self-branding or website or a newsletter or something, any kind of like little things we can take away from someone who's an expert? Um, well, what I would say is, uh, first of all, don't ever say anything you've heard before. If you, if you find that you want to use a, a term or a phrase that's familiar to you, think about it again and dig a little deeper. There's an awful lot of, um, what do you call it, boilerplate out there. Boilerplate. In, uh, I don't like, when I edit uh, for the Tanjung Sai, for instance, which is one of my clients, it's a very old little boutique hotel, and it's all Indonesian run. And so they asked me to help them with their, with their social media copy. And what they do is they write it themselves first, and then I fix it up, which usually means throwing it out. <laughs> and anything that has the word curate, or um, indulge, or delectable, mm. any of these words, I don't use them. You yeah. They're ruined. Yeah. You can't use those anymore. And AI is ruining them even more. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's what, yeah. they, that's what they use. I yeah. used to write for Mosaic, and I'm sure they've got uh, an AI program that they're using now because you don't know what kind of food they're serving anymore. It's just all <laughs> delectable and curated. <laughs> um, let's move on to to the future. You can, and, you can uh, cut that. Okay. No, no, no. We're going to keep that in. Um, I can't. I can't let you leave here without talking about AI. And I, and I'm not expecting. Um, maybe you have very good experience with it. Maybe you don't. But you know, similar to the the generation who are brought up not maybe reading books, they're also brought up with obviously social media and now big influence of AI. If someone wants to write something, people go on chat GPT. Me included, well, actually I'll write something first and then throw it into chat GPT, kind of say, is this okay? Don't use delectable, don't use indulge, don't use create, curated. Um, do you, do you see that as a real danger to, to writing, certainly to fictional writing or, you know, literary artists out there who want to make a career out of this? Is, is it a danger? Uh, I don't think it's a danger. I think um, it's an aesthetic danger on a very superficial level because uh, because it's so prevalent. But anyone who wants to write from their authentic, their authentic imagination or experience uh, won't use that sort of language. Um, it does, though, depend on reading well and a lot. In other words, reading other, reading at a very high level. I think that's really important if somebody wants to write. So if someone does want to write, what would you say the fundamental skills would be needed in order to write well? Are there, there are some things that you know, has to be kind of in that person or learned by that person to write well. Well, a, an experience of reading is really important. Um, Thorough knowledge of the language, being able to use the, the grammar cor correctly, which isn't as widespread as one would hope, and being grown up in, in yourself enough to, to hear your own voice, which is there. I mean, everyone has a voice. Everyone has a way of seeing the world. 
and uh, it can be very hard to hold that from childhood all the way through to old age. It's something that you learn, uh, most people. There are some people who are truly gifted and always write authentically, but uh, you know, all through their teenage years, I think that's exceptional. It's a, it's a stage of adolescence. It's a stage of learning by imitation. And even good writers will imitate the, the writers they think are good. You know, so so it takes a certain amount of growing up. Yeah. Imitate and iterate, not necessarily emulate. Fine, fine line. What, um, where do you see the industry going then? I mean, a similar question, but, uh, you know, when the reading industry is certainly seems to be in decline as social media takes over, podcasts take over, you know, people can listen to a podcast maybe rather than listen to a book or um, read a book or they can listen to a book rather than read a book. Where do you see this writing industry going over the next 10, 20 years? Um, I think it will mutate a little bit, but I think that there's such a need among human beings for uh, stories, for songs, poems, textbooks, uh, just information, the news. There's so much in human communication uh, that we require that, that AI can't do because AI isn't, isn't intelligent. I mean, it's smart, but it can't think yet. You know, it can't perceive, evaluate, uh, re-examine, put forward an opinion. I think uh, it's, that's very far off, mm. I think. Yeah, yet. Um, w what about, the, you mentioned news. I'm interested in kind of your, your opinion or your perception around the news industry, the media industry, if if that is something that we can rely on as a as a true source of written information by intelligent humans who are, you know, and it's not too curated and it's not too compressed and it's not too censored. Is that something again that you think about or you've seen devolve over the last 10, 20, 30 years? Perhaps. I think that with the death of magazines, um as well as uh, book publishing, it's harder for for people to keep up uh, educated opinion. I, as far as news goes, um, as a consumer of news, I think you want to read more widely than you used to be able to. Like I used to subscribe to The Economist uh, and that was my main news source. I wouldn't depend on it anymore. Now I, I have to get my news from a number of other sources because certainly in America, but perhaps everywhere, uh, the news is, it's moldable, it's malleable, and it's susceptible to, to other interests. So you have to be, uh, you have to be wide read in the news if you want to be well informed, I think. That can include social media, that, or, or traditional media that's published on social media. It can be journals that used to be in print and are now online. It could be the some of the great newspapers, uh, local newspapers. I think the responsibility is now incumbent on, on us as the public, right? To go and find these sources rather than before it was, well, this is the source, we get fed that information. Yes, you're Which right. is also the danger because people are lazy and people have 200 characters on Twitter to tell everyone the news and it just becomes a little bit um diluted for a start and necessarily maybe excluding some truths but that's maybe a different conversation altogether <laughs> well yes we see the 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 results of that in societies that are now so divided mm -hmm. your home country i guess being one of them oh yes yeah interesting as we wrap this up um i wanted to just last question about writing advice for for writers, you know, we talked about writing, the, the technicalities, the creativity of it, but what about if people want to make a living? How do, how do people go and get published? How do people go and get recognized? Are there any tricks of the trade or is it a lot of it down to luck? 
continuous work, perseverance, all of that? Um, yes, all of that. First of all, um, it, you, you want it to be good. <laughs> yeah. That's not to be overlooked. Okay, how do you know if it's good? You don't, you don't. You, but um, you use your, your highest abilities of judgment. You try to judge your work as if uh, somebody else had, writ had written it. You, you develop a, a critical editor in yourself, I think, if you want to be a really good writer. Um, and th that, again, that comes from wide reading. Right, I can't emphasize that enough. Uh, the next thing is, uh, you've got a manuscript. If you want to be published by a good publisher, which is the best way to go, um, you and you've written a book of fiction, you absolutely need an agent, and uh, that you just need you need help with. You can look for agents on the internet. That's very hard. Personal connection is much, much easier, much more likely to work. So that's hard. Getting published by a good publisher is hard. If you send in your book to be read, it may not get near anyone who has the right eye for it. So again, luck is part of this. If you self-publish, um, there, uh, there are ways of getting your, your book distributed Fortunately, I haven't had to go that route, and I don't know a great deal about it, but I know that there's a lot online about it. Getting your book recognized, if, if you're with a good publisher, they'll take care of that. Um, if you're self-published or with a very small publisher, then um, you try to get it reviewed in a place where the sort of reader you're trying to reach is likely to read about it. Right. Um, and there are literary festivals, which I think can also help writers a lot. Although reading and writing are solitary activities and literary works, or what do you call it, uh, festivals, are very much talking places. So if you're not a good speaker, you might not do well at, at a literary festival. Some very good writers can't talk at all, unfortunately. So, I mean, it's a... Um, it's not a perfect venue for for promoting a book, but it can help a lot. Well, you're certainly a good talker. It's been an absolute pleasure to listen to you. Thank you so much for, for coming down here and, and spending time with us. It's um, it's an honor to have you. And I really want to invite you to um, narrate your book, Painted Alphabet, for us, just to put it in audio book. I know a lot of people would, would love that. So you can come and use the studio anytime. Oh, wonderful. And, um, yeah, if as long as you narrate the book for us. <laughs> uh, well, thank you so much for your very kind and intelligent attention. Well, thank you. Thank you again. I'm going to leave you with one question, though. Okay. I'm sure a lot of people want to hear this. What's your favorite book? My favorite book? Oh, um, one? My... <laughs> <laughs> okay, give us top three. Okay, top three. That we okay. should all read tomorrow. Well, it depends on what you like, but uh, and I'm not sure you would like any of these, but um, all right, I'll give you three. One is Wolf Hall by Hilary Mantle. It's the first book in a trilogy that she wrote about uh, the marriages of Henry VIII, some of the marriages. Okay. It's just brilliantly written. Um, Nonfiction or fiction? She's written this like a novel. Okay. But it's a, it's, on, a, it's a historical yeah. novel, and uh, it's very powerful. I've read a lot since then. I, I've read the whole trilogy twice, and I admire her so much that I'm reading her early books now, and they're not nearly as good. It's interesting <laughs> to see how she grew, how she grew into this tremendous stature yeah. to be able to write. No one really just makes it straight away, do they? I mean... Very, very, very few people actually like get a hit with their first attempt at anything. No, it's a, uh, it's, it's amazing. Um, another book that I love uh, is called A Paragon, A P E I R, A G O N, A Paragon. Oh, it's a, a paragon. Greek word. Okay. Uh, now that's written by an Irishman about. This is a 
this reads like a novel, but it's a true story. Uh, it's a it's a, the revelation of a true story of two men. Uh, one is Israeli, one is Palestinian, and both of them had young daughters that were murdered by the other side. They're quite topical for today. Yes, and they become friends. It's an incredibly moving uh, story, and also so wonderfully told. And the author's name? Um, I'll send it to you. Um, and then the third book would be um, something I read about 60 years ago called As I Lay Dying by w William Faulkner. It's a very short book, uh, but it was written from the point of view of um, a woman who's dying and her different children. It's just very wonderful as an object. It's like a little jewel. Great. Okay. Well, we're going to check those out for sure. Thank you so much again. Thank hopefully you. we'll have you in here another time, hopefully narrating the painted alphabet. But until <laughs> then, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Matt. Thank you.